uh, we're now into revision mode okay so what you're seeing in front of you is just a breakdown of the syllabus topics okay so for this is all for obviously for a, a, a mathematics subject so OCR unit one all right so master engineering this is the, the the syllabus topics we've covered they call them learn outcomes in, in educational speak um, and on the right hand side what I've done I've put down the breakdown of the papers that the OCR suggests uh, uh, we will have um, in, in all the papers we have to cover learning outcomes one to learning outcome six and you can see the kind of percentages for the different learning outcomes and by far the the chunkiest one the sort of 30 to 40 percent is learning outcome one which of course is the the algebra outcome we spent a fair bit of time really nearly a third of the academic year i suppose on on that outcome alone outcome two is to do with uh, basically graphs um, drawing graphs reading graphs uh, using graphs that kind of thing outcome three was to do with the exponentials and logarithms uh, section so uh, there'll be some questions on that always there'll be questions on that what format they are we're not too sure but there'll always be questions involving those uh, functions Learn outcome four was about trig, so that was where we used our basic um, sine, cos, and tan functions, where we used Pythagoras theorem, and also where we used the sine and the cosine rule. That's all uh, tucked away in learn outcome four. Learn outcome five uh, was the calculus, that's recovered in the last few weeks of the Easter term. And then learn outcome six was the one I gave to you at the beginning of the academic year with statistics and probability. Okay, 10 to 20% of the paper could be on that. So that's the breakdown of the papers and on the right hand side so there's a percentage breakdown, typical percentage breakdowns uh, that you can have on, on different papers. So what I'm going to do now is move into the uh, sort of facilitation mode from my perspective. I want you now to go through past papers. Um, I'm going to facilitate this so the more you engage the more I will engage with you. Any issues you have you contact me, you let me know, or you send me things, you know, whether we're in class uh, uh, you know, or out of class, it makes a difference what we're doing. You can still email me during the week um, any problems you've got. I would strongly encourage you to start engaging with the revision. Let me just briefly go through all the topic areas we've done, just in overview, because we've covered a lot of material in this subject. Um, and as I said to you at the beginning of the year, this, this mathematics level, in my opinion, from teaching uh, technician maths for 20 odd years now, uh, underpins all the other study you do. This is one, really the most important year of your development in mathematics because all these topic areas, almost without exception, will occur in other areas of mathematics as you progress through your uh, various levels of study. So it's really important to have a good understanding of these basic techniques uh, that we cover in, in uh, Unit 1 here. So we started off back in the in September, we looked at basic bod math, precedent rules as they're actually termed. We looked at basic expansion of brackets and factorization, transposition. I started with three variable equations originally, just sort of V is equal to IR kind of equations. Uh, and then went to a more complicated ones later on. Uh, we looked at fractions because they're always an issue. In fact, there's some fractions on the paper we're going to look at in a moment. Um, indices, the rules of indices, laws of indices, that kind of thing we looked at as well. That was all sort of in the first few weeks of the academic year. But I gave you then a statistics assignment, um, which is learning outcome six. And that was where you kind of went away and looked at statistics yourself. You looked at the basic calculation of mean, modes and medians. Uh, you reviewed standard deviation as well, calculating the sort of, um, dispersion, the spread of the data, as it's sometimes termed. Um, and you also looked at drawing pie charts, bar charts, histograms, and so on. So that was all given to you, a little exercise for you to do, and hopefully you've still got that, and you can use that as uh, part of your revision process now. I continued on with the algebra and the lessons, so we looked at further transpositions. That'll be things like V is equal to U plus AT, or V squared equals U squared plus 2ES, more complicated equations uh, to transpose, and again, they crop up in the papers. Then we looked at solving simple equations, that's equations with one unknown in them, sort of uh, x plus 3 is equal to 3x minus 5 kind of type equation. Then we went to some trig with the Pythagoras theorem, some basic trigonometry, the sine, cos, and tan functions, the Socato as it's sometimes termed. We also looked at algebraic fractions and simplifying those, they often crop up on the papers. Then we went into simultaneous equations, that's where we have two unknowns in an equation. Uh, so sort of 3x plus 4y equals to 6, that kind of equation. And we have two of them. Uh, after a test, we went to quadratic equations, which we solved with factorization, and quadratic equations, which we solved with the equation. 
and then we finish that section off with factor theorem and again all these little topic areas that all can crop up on the papers some will crop up on the paper we'll look at in a moment so that was uh, a session we had sort of towards um, Christmas time and after Christmas we moved into logarithms learning outcome three is looking at the logs the definition of a log and the laws of logarithms if you remember and we ended up solving indices equations, something like y is equal to b to the x, and also what's called exponential equations, y is equal to e to the x. Uh, quite complicated equations to solve those, uh, but went through a sort of standard kind of process to, to, to look at those. So again, I would, I would sort of something to recap in your revision here. Then we the graphs, the learning outcome four was graphs, we did linear graphs, that's y equals mx plus c, and we plotted those from an equation and from data given. We looked at non-linear graphs, that's quadratics and cubics. Then we plotted the sine, the cosine, and the tangent waveforms. Remember those periodic, uh, continuous periodic waveforms we looked at for the sine and cosine waveforms, and the uh, periodic but discontinuous tangent waveforms we plotted. Then we moved into using the sine and the cosine rule for normal angled triangles. Solution of those finding sides and angles in normal angled triangles. Then we looked at radian measure. Um, that's where we're using the R is equal, uh, sorry, the S is equal to R theta formula, where angles must be in radians. Don't forget, in one radian, uh, it's about sort of 57.295 degrees, and in one revolution, there are 360 degrees and two pi radians. All those kind of pieces of information you'll need to be aware of. And then there's a little exercise I gave you to look at, I'm not sure if you did or not, but was looking at parallel and perpendicular lines. I put a video up for that, um, how you can tell that the lines are parallel and perpendicular to each other without actually drawing them. And then the final thing we looked at in the lessons was learning outcome 5, which is the calculus. That's a differentiation of standard forms using our standard uh, tables, AX to the N formats, for example, cos AX, sine AX functions, and differentiating them. And an application of differentiation that sometimes crops up is turning points. Um, that's classified application differentiation, um, finding the maximums and minimums, for example. Also, applications could involve given a distance time equation. Uh, um, we sometimes differentiate that to find a velocity time, differentiate that to find acceleration time equation. So that's another application that sometimes crops up, all in standard forms there. And also then we looked at the integration of standard forms, again the AX to the N type forms, but this time integrating them using standard integral tables. And we finished off with applications of integration, that was fine in areas under curves basically. So that was the syllabus that we have covered. As I said there's a couple of smaller topics that we could look at, um, such as transformation of of um, waveforms or transformation of curves and so on but I'm going to leave that for now I want to get into the revision session with you all right so that's the backdrop to where we've come from in what we're going uh, to do suggest we do to start the revision off is to start looking at a paper let's go for a full paper I don't know if you've looked at a paper before but I'm going to go through one with you just generically outline it for you and then I want you to start working on it and then you can email me you can uh, log back on again if you have any problems with the questions and so on so this 2006 um, uh, OCR mass paper uh, is on our system. You can download it. At the back of the paper is the answer sheet. And then if you want more information, is the full marking scheme from OCR. So you have all the information you need uh, for this particular paper. I've not done that with all papers, but with this paper, I've put the full marking scheme at the back of the paper. So I'd encourage you to download that. If any having any problems downloading, then email me, let me know, and I'll, I'll send you the paper. But I would like you to use Teams now, um, uh, where all our um, information is stored. And again, you need the formula sheet, and I'll make sure formula sheet's put up on the uh, Teams um, platform uh, if you haven't got one of those. But you need a formula sheet, and I would encourage you to get familiar with that formula sheet if you're not already um, familiar with it. So in the assessment, you will get given the, the formula sheet for the um, course. And don't forget the formula sheet covers all subjects, not just maths. It covers uh, electrical principles, mechanical principles, science, whatever. They're all covered in the formula sheet. This, this is on the um, front of the actual paper. It says you obviously need a ruler um, and you also need a scientific calculator in the assessment. That goes without saying. I'm just going to take you through some of the uh, comments that are made. This is from OCR on their papers. Generic comments about the assessment, which I would encourage you to be aware of uh, when you sit the, the, the actual paper. The first thing are some sort of um, uh, administration issues to make sure you use um, black uh, pen 
an HB pencil for drawing graphs and diagrams. Okay, so try and remember to, to bring those with you for the assessment. And all the other information about um, candidate number and centre number you'd be given um, at the time you take the test. And write in the spaces provided in the booklet it says there, okay? Um, this is something that's quite interesting to note. This information they show below. The, the usual the paper is, is, has 60 marks to it. I have seen papers with more marks, but generally speaking, there's 60 marks uh, in the paper, okay? And the marks are always given against each of the questions in square brackets, and you'll see that in a moment when we go through the 2016 paper here. So you know if a question says four or five marks, it's a fairly chunky solution they're looking for. If it's one mark, it's probably just a one-line equation or it's a one-line sentence they'll be looking for. So you can judge the kind of response to the questions by the number of marks that is given against each of the questions in the paper. It says where appropriate, your answers should be supported with working. Uh, um, so obviously show all your working. One of the things I particularly notice here, it says a marks may be given for a correct method even if the answer is incorrect. So that's a kind of useful one to remember. Because in a long question, so you've got five, six marks in a question, only one mark is really for the final answer, getting that correct. The other five marks would be for um, uh, the actual method. So showing your working is very key and showing it in a nice, clear, coherent way as best you can under pressure is very important because it doesn't matter really whether you get the final answer wrong. It's all about showing you understood how to do the question. And this is also interesting. It says an answer may receive uh, no marks unless you show sufficient detail of the work. And I think that's very important, that one. So in other words, you could get the correct answer, but you haven't shown how you got it. So you get absolutely no marks whatsoever for that particular question. So again, make sure that you know the, the work in it throughout. Your, your script okay very important that you do that so those are important little considerations there and that's from OCR that's their directive I'm going to take you through the paper now uh, very briefly I'm just going to highlight in the paper what the topics are and then I want you to have a go uh, and at the paper and then any problems you get um, come back to me my sort of intention is that we will try and do a paper a week obviously if you want to do more than that that's absolutely fine or you want to do the revision sheet, I've put a revision sheet up, but I would encourage you to look at the past papers because that's where you get the feel for the entire paper and the way the questions are worded um, and the format of the paper. So I think it's good to look at the papers. So this is the first page and it says at the, at the top of the, the paper always does says this answer all the questions. So the value of each of the questions given in the square bracket, so two marks for each of these questions. So just briefly looking at this um, paper here. So the first question, uh, what you normally find, by the way, on the first page or the first page in a bit, they're, they're in a region of 10 marks on the first page alone. Um, and that's, you know, when you think you want 24 marks to pass the paper, then, uh, you know, 10 marks on the first page or so, that's, um, that's worth having. So I would strongly encourage you to be able to do the technique on this first page. And normally things like expansion of brackets, factorization, factor theorem crops up, algebraic fractions crop up. Uh, those are the kind of techniques we get. A bit of transposition as well will crop up um, on that first page. So, so I would encourage you to be able to do those, those topics fairly proficiently. Um, and don't forget there are videos for lots of these different topics. Now I've tried to put little videos for these if you want sort of further information or a recap. I'm trying to put as much up online as I can, if that helps you at all. Anyway, let's go through the paper very briefly then. So question one, it says remove the brackets and simplify. So obviously that's a, a basic expansion of brackets here. Um, uh, that one didn't, you don't need to expand that bracket in the second bracket, but you expand the first bracket and collect the like terms together. That's what they're asking you to do on that for two marks in that particular question. Okay. On, on part B, question one, part B, they're asking you us to to factorise the problem, so 4x squared plus 2xy, they're looking for the highest common factor. So the reason it's two marks there is because you could factorise it and not have the highest common factor. So you get one mark for factorising, um, but the two marks are if you've got the highest common factor there. All right, so basic expansion of brackets and factorisation are those uh, two little questions there. Continuing on, this is question one, part C. This is an algebraic uh, uh, fraction kind of problem here. Again, you have to understand basic fractions about having a common denominator um, and then be able to bring your uh, fractions uh, together. It sometimes helps to put brackets around uh, the top and bottom where appropriate of the fractions. Sometimes that helps um, when you're factoring up to get your common denominator. 
So that's a basic algebraic type fraction problem, trying to bring everything into a common denominator to one single fraction. It's, now obviously the common denominator will be 12, it's the lowest common denominator. Okay, three marks uh, for that one. So again, th worth having the three marks there. And then part D is a transposition. You've got to rearrange the equation. It's a mechanics equation, something you've seen in science. S equals UT plus a half, AT squared. And again, that can be written. I don't know if that format confuses you or not. Some students prefer, I found, to have it written like this. Um, exactly the same thing, but they like it over the two instead of the half in front. Okay, it makes no difference really, but uh, some, sometimes they find it easy to transpose that equation uh, when it's in that format. So a half of uh, at squared is the same as at squared divided by 2. And again, another chunky three marks there. So 10 marks uh, on that uh, first page. So 10 marks out of 24 there. So it's they're really worth having, uh, having to go at these questions. But there's a bit of work in them. You need to understand the techniques, particularly algebraic fractions and transposition. You need to understand how to do that kind of thing. Question two, I think is the next page. Um, this is solving a simple equation. We mentioned simple equations here. This is what this is. It's a simple equation. How do I know that? Well, it's only got one unknown. So a simple equation there. Again, you'll have to expand the brackets. Uh, so two multiplied by the x and two multiplied by the negative one and three multiplied by the four and three multiplied by the negative x. So be careful of your signs there. Uh, collect the terms together, like terms together, and rearrange to find the value of x. So looking for what the value of x is in this particular question. That's called a simple equation. That's got one unknown in the equation. Part B of question two here is a factor theorem question. There are several ways of doing this, but I would suggest we use factor theorem. Um, and again, you, there are videos on this, or you've got your notes uh, uh, on factor theorem. Um, so you've got some background information on here. So you're given this equation, this function of x, that's really kind of y is equal to the sort of x cubed minus 7x plus 6. That's really what it is. But we often use what's called functional notation. That function of x there is actually the y, really. Um, and what we're showing here, it says show that the function of 2 is actually equal to 0, okay? OK, so all you've got to do is put that value of 2 into the equation for x um, over here. So x cubed, that'd be 2 cubed, minus 7 multiplied by the 2 plus 6. That should give you the 0, what they're looking for. So that's why it's only one mark. It's just using the equation. But you've got to understand what the question's asking you to do. This is the continuation of that question. What they're saying here is that if you find that the um, when x is equal to 2, you have uh, a value of 0. You have a root, in other words. We've got to solve it for all the roots. Okay, So a root is uh, when you choose a value of x that will give you an answer of 0 on the right-hand side of the equation. They're saying it's uh, three integer roots. Now, integers means a whole number, so that's a key in the question. We're not going to be using 0 0.5 or 0 0.25. We're going to use whole numbers. That's what the integer um, means. So uh, we know we've already got the value of 2, and we've got to find 2 more. If it's a cubic equation, which we're told in the question, then there'll be 3 roots, 3 integer roots, it's saying. We've got to find 2 more. And again, I would encourage you to use the factor theorem approach, putting the values, uh, 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 guessing the values of x and putting them into the equation. So you could say when we've tried x is equal to positive 2, you could try when x is equal to positive 1, for example, put 1 into the equation and see if you get 0. And you're looking for two of those. Three marks for that. You can see there's quite a bit of work in there um, to, to solve that, to find the uh, two other roots. But they're whole numbers, that makes it easier. And generally speaking, with these kind of questions, because of time constraints, and they'll always be whole numbers. This question here, we've got to find the, the midpoint of the, on the diagram, the midpoint um, M. We want to find the coordinates of the midpoint M. So in this case, what you'll have to do is average the values in the x direction uh, of A and C. And in the y direction, you have to average the values of B and D to find the midpoint there. And so by calculation at the line uh, DM is perpendicular to AC. That goes back to the parallel and perpendicular lines um, topic area that we looked at. So two marks for that one, a little bit more work involved. We've got to work out the gradient of 
of the lines uh, and then multiply them together and see what the value is. And also calculate the coordinates of point B. I'll let you think that through how you find the coordinates of point B here. There's two marks involved there. But it's just thinking of how to work out the coordinates of point B given the other coordinates of the points. I'll leave that one with you. Then question three goes into our sort of logs exponentials type topic area. So we're given an equation here, um, quite a complicated equation. But if you read the question carefully, it gives you some information here um, about the equation. It will actually simplify a little bit. So if you put the numbers into the equation, you'll find it will uh, simplify down. It won't be quite as complicated. My equation actually simplifies. I'll just put this for reference here to 20 plus uh, 80 um, e to the negative kt. So that's the equation that they're actually going to get you to use in the rest of the calculations. Um, so it looks quite difficult in that format there. When you put the numbers in, it, it simplifies a little bit. And you can see it's an exponential equation. You've got the e function to deal with here. So in part one, using the values given uh, above t0 and tr, write the formula in its simplest form. And that's the simplest form. So putting the numbers in the equation is giving you one mark in this particular case. All right. So that's the equation that they're looking for. I just repeated the, the uh, equation at the top of the page there. Now, what they want you to do is find the value of k in the equation. So um, you'll, you'll, you'll still use the equation uh, shown here. This t is equal to 20 plus the 80. So, OK, but what you're going to do now is find the value of k. They've given you in the question, if you kind of read the question, They've given you some of the values. You've got the uh, T is 70, so you know the left-hand side value. They've given the, the uh, lowercase t, which is 6, so you've got this value over here. And you've got to rearrange the equation for k. So that's one of the exponential type problems we looked at. We've got to find k here. Um, you know, a few steps involved, basically. So that's why we've got three marks involved with the transposition. Be very careful with your transposition. The key is to get this thing on its own on one side of the equation. So get that exponential term on its own on one side of the equation. Make sure it's positive. And just for reference, if you've got everything right up to this stage, you would have got about 25 marks by now. And you would have passed the exam without going any further. Um, and question part three of this, it says now calculate the time uh, taken to the nearest minute for the temperature of the water to drop to 50 degrees C. So what they're kind of saying here is you're going to still be using the same equation. You, you've got the value of K from the previous question. You've worked that out. But they've again given you the, the value of T on the left hand side. T is now 50. You can rearrange. But this time we're going to solve to try and find the, the little T, the time taken. So that's the thing you to find that. It's a very similar rearrangement to be honest. Okay, so worth having those questions because there's quite a few marks associated with logs and exponential type functions because it's an outcome of its own really. So in part four of the question they now want you to sketch on the graph below the capital T values against the little t values. So the capital T values are on the vertical axis and the little t values be on the horizontal axis. I suggest you just calculate three points on the line to give the curvature here. Say when t is equal to 0, t is equal to 20, and t is equal to 50. Then using the value above, which is already calculated, you know the value of k you've worked out from the previous question. You can put values of little t time into the equation, and you can work out the values on the vertical axis, the big T, which is the temperature. And the three points plotted will be somewhere there, somewhere there, and somewhere there. And you could just draw a line through those three points to give you a basic curvature. That's what the question wants you to do, is sketch the graph. Question four, you're now into uh, trigonometric type problems. And again, they could ask you questions related to right angle triangles or normal angle triangles. Um, I'm going to let you think about this one. You're given a triangular plate here and you're given uh, these uh, ABC. These, these would be, really be the angles effectively of the triangles that they look at you. Uh, label them as angles, capital letters, and you're given uh, the um, lengths of the sides here. There are three sides given here, um, and you have to find the angle C. So again, you need to sketch the triangle carefully, um, given the information, and then decide uh, whether you're going to use basic trig on this. If it's a right angle triangle, you can use your sine cos tan type functions. Uh, or if it's not, you can uh, use the sine or the cosine rule, or sometimes both of the rules are required, depending on the problem. Uh, but you've got to find angle C of that triangle. And again, there's three marks for this because a little bit of work involved with this particular uh, question. So again, I'd encourage you to sketch the triangle first of all and then decide 
how you're going to tackle that particular problem, okay? But it will be a, a trigonometrical type problem here. This question, part B, um, we're given uh, an equation, basically. We're given this function y is equal to 40 sine of x. And the first thing they want you to do is to find the value of v given that x is equal to 30 degrees. So again, be careful there with your calculator mode. Whenever using sine, cos, and tan functions, don't forget you must be in the correct mode. Uh, if they've given you degrees, which they clearly have here, then you must be in degree mode. So on your calculator, make sure you've got the little uh, degree um, degree symbol at the top of the screen, not radians, or else you'll get the wrong answer. If they give any the angle of x in radians, and obviously you've got to make sure it's in R mode. So that's why it's only one mark. It's just a question of plugging the numbers in the equation, but you need to make sure your calculator is in the right mode when you do it. And in part two here, they're asking us to solve the equation. It says calculate the two values of x, okay, in the range of um, 0 to 360. And that goes back to the fact when we looked at the uh, periodic waveform. So if you draw a sine curve, I said to you that they were um, continuous periodic waveforms. They're periodic because every uh, 360 degrees for the sine curve, uh, basic sine curve, it repeats itself. So the reason why they've given you a restriction in the answers is because uh, there's obviously an infinite number of solutions. Don't forget if you had a ratio, say, of 0.5 here, let's go and sort of recap, uh, that would have a, an angle here at uh, 30 degrees, but it would also have an angle here at 150 degrees. You remember doing this uh, a few weeks ago. Um, so there are two solutions for uh, and when you take an inverse sine function, there are two solutions between 0 and 360 degrees. And that's what they're hinting at here. They're trying to see, can you find the two solutions? Your calculator will give you one, but you need to know the other one. All right, so again, I'll leave that with you. But that, that's a question of sort of slightly rearranging the equation to get sine of x and then taking the inverse sine of both sides of the equation and realizing that there are two solutions. All right, there are two values of x between 0 and 360. So that's why it's got three marks in it. So it's checking out you understand that that calculation there. Um, and this question here actually brings you to distinction level, believe it or not. If you if you uh, get everything right up to this stage here, you can ignore the rest of the paper and you can walk away with your distinction because 52 marks out of 60 is typically a distinction level um, performance here. What they've given you here is a side panel of a children's slide. OK, so they always give you some kind of context, but don't let that bother you. Whatever it could be in any context they want to give you, really. Um, so don't, don't let that bother you too much. Um, this is going to be an integration question. So this is a side panel of a children's slide here. Um, and, and they're giving us uh, the uh, equation of this curve, this 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 e uh, equation here. And y is equal to this is what y is equal to. It's giving you expression. OK, there. And they've given you some coordinates here. You know, A is 0, 2, and B is equal to 3 and a half. Uh, that's, that's things that are given to you. Uh, you've got to calculate using um, the calculus. So again, it's telling you what to do. You've got to calculate the area of the side panel. Now, if you go back to what we did in the calculus, when you're finding gradients, it points on curves. That means you are differentiating. But when you are finding areas under curves, that means you are integrating. So this is an integration problem. You can see again, it's chunky marks here, four marks for integration process. And, and again, you might find that equation is a bit confusing as it's written. You could write that as y is equal to uh, we can write that way. But they are in the form of ax to the n, so all, all standard forms again and your integral table, so you can integrate them quite nicely really. Alright, so integrating that function will give you the area under the curve. Because it's asked for area, that means it's an integration problem. So you're finding the area. Given the values uh, of the coordinates, because they become the limits of the integration. And again, you need to understand the integration process to know how to use uh, those coordinates for the A and B because they'll become the limits of the integration process. But again, I'm going to leave all that with you. I want you to engage with these kind of questions now. You've got all your notes, you've got videos, whatever you want to look at. Uh, I want you to have a good go at these uh, kind of questions. But the final uh, question here, question six, is all to do with statistics. This is the bit that I gave you to um, learn yourselves really in the um, during the academic year. Uh, and the first question it wants us to, to do is to find the mean of some information given. So they're giving you some length, 
uh, from a machine. Some bars are being produced. Here's again, there's always a context here. Um, some bars are being produced and you've got the lengths of the bars and you've got the frequency, how often that length occurred. So 59, there was no length of that. 59.2, there was uh, three uh, length, uh, bars of that length and 59.45 bars that length. So it goes on. So you can work out then the FXs, summation of the FXs by working out the column on the right hand side. They've told you there's 80 items, 80, 80 bars in this particular batch. So from that you can find the mean. Okay, so three marks there for finding the mean, filling the table basically, and then calculating the mean. That's what the uh, X bar formula is. So that's the mean average. All right, so just want you to do that. There's three marks for that, just by filling the table basically, knowing that that formula. Okay, that's summation of all of those. And then this is to do with standard deviation. This goes back to something we looked at with normal distributions and the standard deviation. Again, I really want you to engage with this, but basically the standard deviation uh, is related to what's called a normal distribution curve. So a normal distribution curve kind of looks a bit like this. Uh, what they're saying is that within uh, 2.8 standard deviations, 99% of the data occurs. So they're saying that there's a uh, 2.58 standard deviation would be there, 2.5 it would be there. So within this part of the normal distribution curve, we would have 99% of the data. So what they're saying is work out the values at these points here. What are the uh, values in terms of geometry at these points here? That gives you the range, if you like, of the uh, data that would fall within uh, 2.58 standard deviations. So you've got to work out those values. So knowing this and knowing that the standard deviation is 0 0.3, so each sigma value is uh, 0.39 I should say um, you can actually work out what these uh, upper and lower values of your ranges are but also say th this this point here is the mean that's the x bar location at that point there so so the standard deviations come plus or minus the x bar values in the middle here. so I'm going to get let you have a look at that um, it's a fairly straightforward calculation actually it might seem complicated at the moment because you may not remember uh, much about that uh, but it's only two marks because there's not much in the way of calculations there to do if you understand what to do. And then the last thing to finish off the paper is a probability question. Okay, you're given the uh, probabilities of two machines, they call them A and B here, or two components, in this case failing. Um, so you can work out the probability of both uh, components failing at the same time. But be very careful, uh, well, the answer you're looking for is find the probability that the machine is still operating at the end of the day. Now you have got the probability of failures here. All right, so you can work out the probability of uh, the two machines failing. Okay, but the actual question wants you to find the probability that the machine is still operating at the end of the day. Um, so be careful of that when you're looking at the final probability you're looking for. Okay, they've given you the probability of failure, but you are, if you like, looking at the probability of success. Uh, um, so, so be careful how you use that information. Not too much in the way of calculations, um, uh, but three marks for this because the understanding of the question is the key here. A very simple calculation, but do you understand what's going on uh, in the question? And that's it. That's the paper. That's the 2016 May paper. Any queries you've got, you get back to me, you email me. I will not give you the sort of detailed solution. I'd have to give you the marking scheme here, but I know some students still struggle with the marking scheme, understanding quite how OCR have laid out their work, because it's just generally the answers um, there. But um, uh, but certainly you can engage with me, email me anytime you want in, in the week. Uh, if you need to contact me and I'll try and support you with your learning okay but the onus now is on you to engage with this from here on in take ownership of your learning now and then use me as a, a sort of facilitation tool to help you